What's up, everyone? Welcome back. We got week four. We're going to run through, hopefully, a nice conversation style uh, back and forth here. Going to talk about a couple of different topics. Um, we got a few guys in on the Zoom as well. If you guys want to introduce yourselves quick so you can pop up. What's going on, guys? Jeff Massa. What's up? I'm Cole. Pat. Nice. And then... Obviously, you know us guys, we're celebrities here in the facility and on the podcast. Uh, but this week, we just want to talk about feel feel versus real. I think it's um, something, whether it was in our own careers and stuff we were working on or trying, if it's stuff that we do playing golf, if it's stuff we see on a daily basis with the athletes we train, it's definitely something that's prevalent. And a lot of times that's where like the art of coaching comes into play and you have to know that the athlete might feel like they're doing something, but that's not actually what's happening. And that's where creating environments and stuff like that, you can kind of trick the athlete into getting the right feel. And I think that's something that I've learned in the last few years that I definitely did not understand when I was a player. And I think a lot of the athletes that we're going to be coaching or working with on a daily basis probably don't understand this concept much. So I think it'll be really good for them to kind of hear our perspective and the common things we see. And then like you guys, your perspectives as as you played recently and as you coach a lot of athletes as well. So I'll let you kick it off, Andrew. You definitely had some good ones. Sounds good. So from my coaching experience, um the, the biggest a couple of the biggest ones I've seen um as a hitting coach is if a guy is if a guy's attack angle, uh, meaning his bat is going down to the baseball as he's uh, as he's making contact, um, if he's to clip that baseball, it's usually going to produce like a weak infield pop up, and the hitter in the hitter's mind, a lot of the time they're going to think that they are under that baseball. When in reality, if they're working a little bit more uphill, uh, they're going to make a lot more stronger. Uh, better collision with the baseball and uh, it's just that's like like Carson was talking about you have to find like little ways to be able to trick the athlete uh, to be able to get them to properly work a touch more uphill um, so that they that way they do make that good collision um, but that's definitely a common one I see with hitters where um, they're very down to the baseball clip it and they're th they're thinking in their head, oh, I need to be even more down to the baseball. Uh, another one too. And uh, last year, I watched a presentation by the Red Sox hitting coach, and he talked about uh, timing. And a big thing he that I'd kind of known for a little bit, but it definitely opened my mind is you can uh, roll over to the pull side and still be late. Um, your timing could still be late in that sense. Um, so if you think about timing, it takes part in, um, there's two windows. So you, for hitting, you need to be on time when the pitcher release, releases the ball and you need to be on time to contact as well. Um, so if you're late to the pitcher release and then you're rushed to contact, you can be like, that's not a move you wanna make. You wanna be more in control of that first move um, to be able to then strike the ball out in front of the plate and be on time in both windows. But if you're late to that first window, you can easily rush through your swing and roll over to uh, the shortstop. Uh, so those are two specific examples I can think of for hitting where, you know, in that scenario, a hitter might think that he's early when in reality he was late to that first window I was talking about. So um, those are two specific feel versus real uh, things with hitting that can definitely, like, can definitely, you have to, like Carson was talking about, you have to find a way as a coach to be able to trick the athlete to put them in the be best position to succeed. So I have a question on that, Andrew. So yes. essentially how, I think, I'm sure we'll talk about this a lot more mm -hmm. on like examples of how to do this, but if you have someone who has a negative attack angle and yes. they're, they, the kid thinks they're under the ball or their timing's off, whatever it is. What? How would you show them 
the difference of feel versus real for that? Like they obviously have a thought of what they're doing. You have a thought of what they're doing. How would right. you then explain to them and show them like, here, here's something we can try. Here's an overcompensation we can do. Yes. Like what's a drill that you would do for something like that? Yeah, for sure. So I think a good one for the first example I used um, where a kid is clipping the baseball and down to the baseball, a really good one for that would be if you were to take a plyo ball, a plyo hitting ball that has sand in it, and it's really going to overemphasize contact quality. And uh, you were to throw the hitter lobs and just tell them to try to smash the ball into the top of the cage. I think that's going to kind of overcorrect the move where they're down to the baseball to, to where they can feel themselves working uphill. So essentially because that the lob, the arc is coming down, they have yes, to match that. Exactly. That would be very good for me, who has a right. very poor swing as far as baseball I can swing pretty hard but like it's very level if not down very mm -hmm. old school 15 year old thought process right. right where like I need to work into that angle um I think going into like my stuff a little bit into that as well is on like the movement capacity side of things is I specifically if I was to do that drill right may struggle on how well, like I'm, I'm swinging the way I normally swing I'm trying to swing more up it's not necessarily that you're trying to swing more up it's more about body position right right 100%. so you work with me a little bit on this and it's not necessarily trying to do this more right it's more just trying to get my spine angle exactly. to be matched in this plane and essentially not changing my swing much but just getting my body to a good position so I can exactly. match that um so a lot of stuff on uh, what I do too is like it's going to be a lot of video feedback for that as well mm -hmm. because we don't have things like a blast sensor that can essentially just measure that angle we need to measure like spine angle so exactly. a lot of that can be like video feedback or just seeing like in a mirror through there and i don't think kids realize the angles that they can get to in certain positions or they feel like they're getting to a specific angle it's really just a very minor change so you almost have to overcompensate exactly. a little bit and i think that can help a lot as well but it's all about feedback I think, 100 with those things so using data using video um, in the correct ways, and that's where coaching can come into it a lot. We're not just going to have these kids just film themselves doing 100 reps and really not know what they're doing. They need to have the coaching feedback. That's where we can come into it. Same thing with the data, right? A kid could be swinging, and like a lot of the data is pretty good now, it seems, especially like not that I know a ton about blast motion, but like it does seem to give you like a green, red, yellow, yeah, right? Yeah. So it can give you some good feedback if you are on your own, but a lot of it still comes back to making sure you're communicating that with your coach to make sure that like, because just because it says green doesn't mean it's necessarily specifically good for you, right? It just means in a generality thing, it's good, right? If you're on the right track. So those are good. No, ones, 100%. Yeah. And I think I it's funny that you talk about your swing because that was what I first thought about was like how to create constraints for someone like Logan who has good bat to ball skills, but is too steep, right? Mm -hmm. You could use a high tee, right? And have the athlete understand that they're trying to hit the ball hard right even just over the l screen doesn't have to be like up and they're the solution they're going to come up with is going to be more on plane and a little bit uphill to make the best contact they can and with like we have the hit tracks so you can just set it up for hit tracks mm -hmm. and say see how hard you can hit a ball that's off this high tee yep and if you give them 10 chances at it by probably chance five they're going to have realized that swinging up is going to be probably the best position but like Logan just talked about, it's not necessarily an up swing. It might just be getting yourself in a new position and keeping your same swing. And next thing you know, you're hitting the ball just as hard as you normally do, but it's going way further because you're hitting the ball at proper launch with launch that you're matching, I guess, or attack angle that you're matching. So mm -hmm. it's really good stuff. 100%. I think to go off that a little bit too is I think that's a great idea. And Something you could do to create variability off of that too is have the athlete take six swings and try to hit them at so like the first two swings have have them try to hit the ball at more like line drive launch angle and then the next two swings have them try to hit the ball like a little bit higher maybe a through an outfielder and then the next two swings have them try to burn an outfielder that way they can feel like Logan was talking about like how their side bends and how that affects like the ball flight off of that too so totally it creates variability yeah I think one of the best things we've done in terms of obviously going on the other side of it where it's pitching and like variability is we play this horse on the track man which I think is like one of the best ways to see like real versus feel like I'm a very low three-quarter guy and I, I'm never gonna be able to throw like a true 12-6 curve 
So if we're all trying to play around and try to get the most horizontal possible, sometimes me getting away from being like underneath the ball, like my true slider, and all of a sudden thinking about being on top, like I'm throwing a true 12 six is going to make it jet over to the left, like, and create a lot of horizontal. Um, and we mess around with changeups and fastballs. We throw every pitch possible on there and just messing with different stuff and having the, the, the tool like a track man where we can see how messing with different things results, um, I think is huge for, you know, seeing what feel ends up being yeah. real. Massively. Well, I think yeah. you, you guys can specifically, all you guys can probably talk about it a lot is we see kids all the time that ask about, well, like if I, if I drop my slot a little bit to throw this slider or this change up, so I can get better spin on it. Our, our hitters going to be able to realize that that's something we can talk about. Andrew can talk about that. They're first, they probably can't realize that, but like most people think they're going from like here to a complete sidearm. Yeah. And really like when we talk about track man data is like, they're really probably only actually dropping like four inches, which is really like from like here to like there. And there's no way that they can pick up on that. But yeah. like, that's something you guys can talk about a little bit more. It's like, it's a big difference between feel versus feel on that. Yeah. Yeah, feel versus real to me, pitching wise, makes me self reflect a lot on change ups and watching myself throw a change up yeah. on high speed video like Edger and just seeing, like, all right, I understand how the ball's supposed to spin. I understand what it should feel and look like, or I guess I don't understand what it should feel like. But I understand what it should look like. I understand all of the things. Yet when I go to do it, I throw it with backspin. And then I watch that, and then it's like, okay, I need to try to do something else. And it's funny because to me, it feels like a great changeup, but then TrackMan just shows up as it being the, and then when I do lower my slot a little bit and just kind of manipulate my wrist a little bit, I can actually create a pretty good one. And yes, I am dropping my arm slot a little bit, but I would much rather take a, a much higher quality pitch in terms of separation from my fastball than throwing a really mediocre changeup to quote unquote match my fastball, right? Because now you're just throwing a BP fastball. And if you throw it in the middle of the plate, it's just an easier pitch that can get crushed. Versus if you lower your slot a bit, the hitter might know it's coming, but you throw a really good changeup at the bottom of the zone. You're forcing the hitter to swing at a pitch that has ideal metrics to get a ground ball. So it's kind of like that's the chess game of it. But you, we see a lot of times kids come in and they think they throw two different breaking balls, right? We see this all the time. And then they actually just throw one consistent spin, maybe a few miles an hour different or a couple inches of movement different. But really you can just take both of those, combine them into one, try to throw it hard and create the best shape you can. And now they know, okay, this is my breaking ball. This is what it is. If I can own this one, now I can work on trying to throw a second. But I should only be trying to throw two types of breaking balls if I can number one, consistently throw one shape and then number two, if that second one is going to value, like add value to my arsenal, because if you can just throw like, you know, one slurve and then a slower slurve, like that's not creating any sort of like variety to your arsenal versus if you throw like a hard tight slider and you throw a big slurve, now you have two different speeds, two different shapes. And if you can do that consistently, it's something that's worth trying to do. But a lot of kids think they throw two different breaking balls when in reality they just throw one, or they think they throw a change up. In reality, it's just similar to the fastball. Or same thing with the four seam and two seam fastballs. A lot of times guys think they're throwing two different fastballs. In reality, it's just one big cluster. But I think also knowing that stuff is really important because you could go do pitching lessons and try to work on your breaking ball. But if you consistent don't consistently spin your fastball the same way then it's not really worth trying to perfect the off-speed pitch yet. So I think that's like a lot of feel versus real when it comes to throwing, especially manipulating the ball. Cole? Uh, yeah, so kind of going off of uh, your idea of feeling like you're throwing sidearm, something like I know Jeff and I preach, like throwing from different arm angles and all that. But if, if we find an athlete that has like a, an elbow or hand farther, much farther or below their kind of shoulder plane and giving them that kind of feel of, oh, let's throw sidearm on here and like to try to match it. Or if they're way below, let's throw over the top on here. Then it kind of corrects the plane and we can use the kind of data of a video or a track man to kind of help us 
um, prove this and show that it's more useful to be uh, very effective. Right, yeah, so kind of going off Cole, when I think of feel versus real, the first thing that comes to my head is like stuff we worked on with the guys this summer of release height. It's like, all right, I'm struggling to get my hand in front of my slider and get, get it to go sideways. Well, the easier way for me to do that in my career was to try and drop my arm slot. But then I looked first time I was able to use a track man unit was the summer consistently. And I could kind of tell, I could kind of see that, oh man, I really thought I dropped my elbow on that one and threw it sidearm, but no, it was a two inch difference. Um, and then another, another good point that I want to bring up was oftentimes the summer we would work on guys throwing a bullpen that would kind of have a lot of inconsistencies. Something I like to do was use a tennis racket and kind of use that tennis racket as an arm action drill mid bullpen which kind of got that feel versus real concept going. Um, a lot of times when someone feels like their arm, like when, when you when you do the tennis racket drill and you don't do it with fluidity and it's not smooth, it's kind of choppy and it doesn't really flow well. And a good feel for that, or a good example of the feel versus real would be that because when someone does the tennis racket drill and they feel their arm climb up and get on time, they're like, oh, that's what that's supposed to feel like. And then I like to do it mid bullpen because it's, stop a guy, tell him to do the tennis racket, and then mid bullpen, they get the tennis racket feel, bang, their arms on, up on time. And that's just something that's really worked for me, uh, coaching younger athletes especially. Yeah, I was going to say, um, to, to get athletes to get into certain positions, obviously we want to do stuff like that where there's constraints or external cues. So if you guys had any uh, other things that you tend to use for external cues, but a lot of it does, I think, Jeff, that's a great one because – it'll you give an implement to an athlete with a little bit of guidance and then they have to figure it out right and there's it's they're not going to get hurt doing it but they're going to have to explore and find these different paths to what feels best for them and i just if you guys had any other i can talk about it later too on the, the more strength and conditioning side of it but like i think so much of it is just like finding familiar positions that they understand and translating that into other things right like we talk about a lot of mechanical things car with like you know being a guy who coils versus a guy who has more of a vertical shin and stuff like that. And anything you guys have on as far as external cues or, or things like that that you would use for that? I think it's really important to know how the athlete is going to respond to the cues you give them, right? So like that's the whole feel versus real in a nutshell is that if you have three kids in front of you and you give them all the same cue, it might lead to proper solution for kid number one halfway for kid number two and it might take number three way off the tracks and you need to know like how they respond to cues and which cues and then it's really important to like have them tell you back which cues make sense to them because oftentimes they're interpreting what you say differently than even how you're saying it which is also super important to know right they're not just taking what you say and now they completely understand it and they're like with you they're in their own little world understanding what you're saying in their own way, making their own verbiage of it. So if you can understand what words and stuff click for them too, you can then start to feed those back to them. So I think just kind of understanding how they're going to respond to cues because you don't just want to like keep beating the horse if, if the athlete's not making an adjustment or responding to it. And I think that's probably a common frustration that we hear when people come to us is that like we might bring up something they struggle with and they immediately like have like five reasons as to why they struggle at it. And it's because they've just been told why they haven't been given any sort of like creative way to figure out how to do it the right way. And so it's just trying to replace those thoughts and those words with words that are going to be more useful and thoughts that are going to be more useful for them. I think some basic stuff you can do of feel versus real is just like, the, the L screen drill that we did last year, right, is like you stand in front of that L screen and it feels like you're going to throw the ball right into it. Then you unwind and you throw it and you have plenty of space. And that's just a nice little feel versus real thing you could do on your own. You could do it with a fence. You could do it anywhere. You just have someone stand in front of you. You're not going to hit them. You're going to throw it around them. Um, same thing, like you can put Sharpie on the baseball and try to create some desired spin, just playing catch nice and light and see like, oh, am I actually doing this? Or is the black dot just moving all over the ball, right? Because if you're trying to create uniform spin, you should be able to color part of the ball and see that ball. It's, you can use your iPhone to do that. Uh, but I think, 
think most of it just comes down to understanding what the athlete is not doing correctly or what they could do better. And then understand where they're at with their thought process, like Andrew talked about. And then from there, deciding what you're going to do and not just have this like copy and paste coaching method for for the same kid the same way because I think it's so much of it has to do with like Jeff said right you're probably breaking that bullpen up at a time when the athletes kind of been spraying the ball maybe it's getting a little too fast right everything's kind of speeding up on them it's a great way for you to just like unplug them for a sec let them do that let them get back to like a nice mental stable place and then they can throw their their last 10 to 15 pitches feel really good about the day rather than just letting it run away from them too so I think that's like another thing of like if someone's really struggling at the same thing over and over again like figure out a way to just break that up don't let them just keep continuing to pattern it the wrong way because I think that's probably pretty common I think bringing it into something that the athlete does really well already Right. So I think we come across certain athletes, whether it's hitting or pitching or whatever it is, where they certain ones are going to be very good at the skill of baseball and certain ones are and they're not going to be maybe as good at the lifting portion of things. Right. And that's why I can use the skill of baseball to relate back to lifting. Right. And same thing, we're going to have guys who are really good at lifting, but may, may not have the awareness or the proprioception for pitching. Right. So getting them like we talk about getting a hinge. Right. And like a hinge can be very similar to the initiation of a deadlift. And if they're really good at deadlifting, but they're really bad at hinging on the mound because their knee drifts over their toe, like familiarizing it with what they're good at, I think is really important as well. Absolutely. I think that's huge. And like some mechanical things I think too that come to mind are like, uh, and this stuff is probably common in like running. It's probably common in swinging. But a lot of times an athlete is like trying to use their legs, right? And and in their mind, they don't know what use their legs means, but they're just going to try something. And so something that they're familiar with is just kind of like getting to extension, right? And just like getting into this position and feeling like, oh, wow, I did this, so I'm using my body. But when you put your body in that position, it doesn't work the way that it should for helping us do what we're trying to do. Same thing with like an athlete that's trying to run. If the athlete tries to run and they immediately present this way, right? That's probably not going to be ideal for them to be at peak speed or also being an athlete of like change direction, right? That's not a good position to be ready to change direction. in. So I think like you don't want to like tell a kid that what they're doing is just wrong, right? Right away and make them feel like bad about themselves, but just kind of challenging what they know about how they're supposed to use their body and that's where like the proprioception feel versus real stuff kind of comes into play where it's like we see it all the time athletes that have no idea where they are in space right and it's pretty impressive because a lot of these athletes are pretty good at making contact and hitting the ball and throwing strikes and like so they can organize and they can do stuff it's just a matter of like figuring out that they don't understand how to use their body and then trying to show them, I guess, like proper technique of someone doing something and then kind of show them again what they're doing. Now, hopefully they start to self-recognize some of the things that they're they're not doing properly. And now they can try to experiment. And if they have the feedback loop of like the video on TrackMan or video on hit tracks or whatever it might be, they can now start to, you know, explore a little bit more and try things a different way and realize like oh if I use my legs this way where I think about more like a rotation and I stay in like a better position with my pelvis now they throw the ball harder and all of a sudden they're like oh wow that's crazy and now they want to get really good at that right because like the first time they've tried it and had some little bright success with it but they're nowhere near good at it right they've been practicing this early extension for years and now they're going to try to do something different so it's also like understanding that when you try to do something different it's not going to happen or change right away and like you might think that you're doing everything in your willpower to make that change happen and you might even know like what you're trying to make happen 
but you still might not be able to make it happen. And it's okay. You got to be okay with that, I think, too, because it's like, if you want to get better at something like this, especially something mechanical, there's a good chance you're going to get worse before you get better at it. And you need to be able to like be okay with that going in. That's why we don't like to do this stuff mid-competition mode, right? We like to do this more like this time of year, right? Or closer to Christmas and then in the holidays. And then after that, we want to be in compete mode and not change how we move mode because that's very hard to do when you get into competition and you want to be confident with how you're moving when you get into competition. So I think some of what you're talking about involves because you can't just tell a kid to do a new thing when you're doing the entire like pitch sequence or the entire swing or the entire sprint, right? Even if it's a shorter sprint. So it's like involves that whole part, whole training where you would do the whole skill, break it down to the part you want to work on and then try and bring it back to the whole skill again. Um, and I think that can help a lot with the feel of specific positions and understanding like for me, it would be maybe just moving kids into like more of like an isometric, right? And finding where is the bottom of this squat? Where is the bottom of this hinge? what is the depth you should be going to let's own that position so same thing if it's like a pitching thing we talk about like not getting the early extension knowing where your pelvis is in space and understanding it like wow when my pelvis rotates when it's not anteriorly tilted this feels a lot better i feel this nice stretch from my front hip to my back shoulder i don't feel it in my low back right kids might not realize that like the low back pain might be coming strictly because like your butt is kicked out in this position you're trying to rotate right well if you're doing that really fast you're not going to realize that's the point that's causing that problem. But you can get here and you can move into that position. You can just see how much more I can rotate and the tension that's created through my shirt through there versus being here, right? Oh, lock, sorry. Uh, but that's the difference that they're going to be like, okay, maybe that's where it's coming from. So we, let's work on this position. Let's just start in this position. Let's get here and create, again, a familiar position through there, right? Um, I think it's really important. And I don't know, Dan, if there's any specific thing. I know I've seen you do a lot of drills through there that does that segment specific body parts and take the arms out of it or or take the lower half out of it and stuff like that. I don't know if there's any like whole part, whole type training that works for you and like what specific emphasis emphasis that might be putting on that body part to get them better at, like Carson said, maybe, maybe coming up quickly or not having enough arm drive, uh, not being rotational. That's another thing, being rotational through sprinting. Sprinting is not linear, it's rotational, right, Paul? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the, the big thing with, especially with like running or throwing or things like that, and especially starting like with younger athletes, the whole part whole is huge. Because your body, especially with like running, that's how, you know, our knees bend one way. We're not horses. You know, our knees don't bend backwards. Like our body is made to run. It's made to jump. It's made to do these things. So throughout like the training that I do a lot with my, like my runners and things like that is I let them run. I let them sprint. I let them do whatever they naturally do. You know, what, what the feel is for them. Um, and through that, like then I'll kind of see where is their pelvis? Where is their where is their foot strike? Where is their posture? Are they running like this? Are they actually using their arms? Are they getting in too much extension where they are leaning backwards? And then that changes where their foot. Strike. So that that's you know the the task of me as the coach is to look at the whole, the feel, kind of explain what I'm seeing to kind of get them to understand the real, and then like Logan was saying, put cones down modify their stride, work on frequency, work on length, you know, get them more on their toes, get them more in a forward lean position, take away their arms, those type of things where you can kind of, as your, as the coach, base your drills and skills off of their feel, explain to them, you know, what the real is, and then try on that, you know, the whole part whole on that last hole kind of find a nice little balance and don't expect like perfection you know running depends on how tight you are how you sleep all like all those other you know external factors will change how you perform but understand where they are coming in what you want to focus on that day like what their major weakness their major strengths are um and then also not take like five hours i could have kids doing drills for five hours and eventually they'd be perfect but it'll all go to hell next day because they slept and they forgot everything but 
you know, kind of training the body to understand where they are, take the parts down that you want to focus on that day, and then see if the real second real feel of the whole motion again has any difference, not just, you know, uh, visually or, you know, through video or timing or anything like that as a coach, but to kind of reconnect with that athlete to be like, okay, so you did this coming in, we kind of broke it down here and put you over hurdles or took your arms away and put, you know, put, put a stick in your hand. And, you know, did you feel any difference after we did that whole part again? And again, the communication, especially on feel versus real, you can throw a million different, you know, and, and running and, and track and things that are, you know, they're pretty finite, but efficiency is what we're always looking for, especially like with pitching and hitting and things like that. You want to be able to perform the motion well so that you can perform it faster, more explosive for a longer duration of time at a harder, uh, you know, intensity level, things like that. So making sure that you do get back to communicating with the athlete is really, really key. Because again, when the gun goes off, I can't help them run faster. You know, when they set themselves in the throwing circle or on the runway, I can't do anything. It's up to them to make sure that they know this is what it should feel like. And when the field does connect with the real, now we're talking PRs, now we're talking about dropping your times or increasing your distances or or things like that where um communication especially in a sport i mean i know you guys don't talk to the pitcher after every single pitch so they do have to understand mm -hmm. you know when they get the ball in their hand and they put their toe on the, the mound or the way i'm trying my, i'm working on my baseball my lingo. baseball lingo i'm getting there slowly but surely you know, once you get the pitch in and the clock now goes off, you know, you need to know what your sequence is, you know, so like the field versus real that I talk a lot about with sprinters, even though it's just 100 meters, visualize your race. You, you As a coach, we need to make sure that we break down the event, make sure we break down the phases, the different things like that, um, you know, not just in practice, but also remind them, hey, there is a drive phase, there is a transition phase. There is a float phase and there is a work, you know, so kind of teaching them, teaching them what the sport entails will get their feel to be a little bit more real yeah. as, as we kind of, you know, progress through seasons and things like that. And I know our seasons are different than your guys's, but same type of thing. We're working certain things at certain times and eventually I'm not going to change anything two weeks before the championship season. We're just kind of hoping that, uh, everything that we have done physically or mechanically has kind of set itself in so that the real is as close to the feel as possible. So yeah, well, that's where it comes in so much of it's it's about learning for the athletes, not just being told what to do. Oh yeah. Right. That once they understand why we're working on certain things, one is going to help with buy-in, right? Mm -hmm. It's also going to just help them understand their body more. So eventually they can make adjustments on their own. And we're just here to communicate and be like, hey, do you think this is an adjustment I should be making? Yes, no. Am I thinking too much about this thing? Do I really need to be do this? We'll talk about this more another time, I think, is making sure that we're working upstream as much as we can, right? Same thing with like sprinting. Like if their leg fold at top speed is the problem, is it really that that's the problem? Or is it something previously to that that's yeah. causing the problem? Yeah. If, if, if leave leg block is a problem, is it really the leave leg block weakness that's the problem? Or is it, is it something further up the chain? Like yeah. let's start up the chain as far as we can. Maybe it fixes things down the river. Um, so I think that's really important as well. Okay. Yeah. 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 And like understanding which drills or what you need to do in your pre-work of any kind, right? To create those feels for you that equal real results right so like oftentimes it's like pelvic control for a kid and we realize when they're throwing that they really struggle to control their pelvis especially as they try to move forward and then rotate so it's like okay the next day when they're taking them through their stuff again and they're doing pelvic awareness circuit and they're learning this stuff you can then explain to them, well, this is really important for you to do every day before you throw because it's something you struggle with when you're throwing. So we need to get you to feel and understand where you are in reality doing this stuff every day so that when you throw, you don't have to think about it as much.
right? And so same thing that when you were talking, I was thinking about the youth group, right? And so youth group, like easiest way to get them all moving and focused right out of the gate is some kind of like, you know, running activity or game where it's moving around outside. And so one thing we were doing a lot of was running around cones, right? In almost like a figure eight type position or an S and trying to accelerate like out of the curves. And that alone was good for just like organizing how well they're moving and change of direction. But then we did it with holding a PVC pipe above their head. And it was immediate which kids understood how to control where their pelvis was so that they could continue to run well. And some kids had no idea how to do that and they could not run more than 30% of what they're running without the PVC pipe mm -hmm. until probably their second or third time through when they started to realize it a bit and then took the PVC pipe away and then they're back at it and now they're going faster or they just have more co control and awareness than they did before. And so these are great ways, right? To like, we talk all the time about common flaws or common like things, tendencies that we see with athletes. So if you're like a coach of a team or a high school coach or whatever, and you're trying to design some of this stuff into practice, well, try to look at your team and what are some of the common, you know, things they present that you think they could do better and try to design some drills that are going to create more of a better, like, real, right? And it's going to lead to them now having new fields and hopefully understanding new solutions to this stuff. Right. So it could be as simple as if you coach Little League and your team hits the ball on the ground all the time, just throw some big nets out in front of home plate and throw them BP and just try to tell them to hit the ball over the nets. It's going to make it really easy for their thought process. It's going to create some new fields for them. And now they're actually going to hit the ball in the air, which now you're going to hit doubles and triples and home runs and your team's going to be psyched. So I think it's a lot of it is just kind of programming some of this stuff in when you're doing stuff like team practice or whatever it might be. And then also understanding individual athletes tendencies or the assessment and stuff we pick up from there of what this person really needs to do before they perform a skill or before they do something in the gym, right? Like so I watch certain kids do squats and deadlifts and they do them differently than other kids and they need to do their warm up sets or their certain things before they get to working sets differently than another kid who might just step in and start and get into it pretty quickly. So I think it's all it's all the same kind of stuff where it's you just need to know the individual a little bit, but also as you're doing stuff in practice, try to create environments that can consistently lead to good feels or the feels that you want to promote because you control that as a coach. And that's really important to understand, I think. Yeah, I think it's all, it's all about problem solving, right? And figuring out what the solutions are. And that's why we start with an assessment to figure out who you are as an individual athlete. It gives us some of the puzzle pieces to put together. But then as training goes, we get to put together more and understand why you are an, an individual athlete, what makes you unique. That's where we both have the data for hit tracks and track man and all that stuff, as well as the lifting numbers. And it just all builds upon itself to eventually have you as the athlete be the person that understands yourself so well that you can understand in the moment of having problems. We talk about all the time, if you're a three pitch pitcher, very rarely do you have all three pitches when you're actually going out there, right? Or if you're a hitter, very rarely do you have complete plate coverage of all pitches, right? It's more like I'm struggling with the outside pitch. It's like, okay, well, like now it's time to problem solve. Now it's time to find a feel that's going to get me into a position to have success when this person's attacking me on the outside corner or figuring out like, okay, I don't have my breaking ball today. Like, let's figure out what the problem is and how I can solve this to get back to having that, at least it be some sort of a pitch. We know it's not gonna be great on that day, right? Um, same thing for a sprinter, right? You're not gonna dome them up with figuring out like all these internal cues right before they go up to their race. But if they understand their own body more and they're like, yeah, I think I'm just getting a little bit too lengthy out of the blocks and to get my foot into the ground more, it becomes a simple cue of get my foot into the ground. And it might help them right there just a little bit. It's not major things once they understand their body, right? And it yeah. might be an overcompensation, but overcompensations are fantastic. But you can't do an overcompensation. You can't fix things unless you understand where you are currently, right? I think that's a lot of, of, of reflection for the athletes is understand what are you doing currently? So what? So the changes that it can be made, essentially. Mm -hmm. yes. I think a big thing too, like for all these changes we're talking about, is for the athlete to be very process driven too. I think 
if you're results driven and you get really you know get knocked down by failure or whatnot um once like for hitting like you can almost for certain things say the hitter is working on attack angle like i was talking about earlier you can almost take ball flight out of it and look at the blast sensor and the blast metrics and just look at attack angle and measure progress based on that and i think if you have with the with all the technology we have here, it's easy for us as coaches to create a process-driven athlete um, because of that tech and those, like Carson was talking about earlier, those tight feedback loops we can provide. Good stuff. Thanks, all right, man. I just wanted to share my thoughts on the topic too. Let's go. Um, I think when you originally mentioned that this was kind of what we were going to talk about today, the feel versus real idea, I think for me, one of the things that comes up a lot um, is obviously throwing a baseball happens in such a, a short duration of time. And this kind of goes back into um, how you're kind of cueing people and the idea of potentially getting domed up. And one of the things that I like to do um, with guys is it's almost like a, I guess you could say it's kind of like a, a fire and ice type of combination where if you have someone that's spinning off, I feel like everybody is going to wind up telling that athlete like, oh, just stay closed longer. Um, and, and they come up with all of these things where it's impossible to think about how you're going to stay closed longer and something that's happening like that. And the best way to kind of correct that, in my opinion, this is a pairing that I've done a lot lately, is if you're spinning off, like you, you clearly don't know what it's like to be on time and to be in a good position when your front foot lands and trying to get a guy to land from above and have a little bit better direction on something like a roll in and then giving them something like a quick pick or a turn and burn where they're, you're almost putting rotation into overdrive. I really have found a lot of success in that combination because you're going to be in a situation where it's very easy and you can lock that in with the roll in. But then when you put something together, with a quick pick or a turn and burn where that's being put in overdrive, like you're, you're probably going to be pretty bad at it. Um, and somewhere in the middle is where you're going to want to be. And the good thing is, is you can, you can gauge that from a velocity standpoint and you're not really talking about, you know, thinking about anything. It's, it's really just, just do the task. And eventually over, you know, you're going to create some sort of adaptation where that's going to be a feel that you lock in and then you take that to the mound. And I think it, it's almost like rather than feeling like you're staying closed longer, just manipulate the situation and try to find some sort of middle ground. And that's going to be where you want your end result to be. So I think that's really what it comes down to. I know we've touched on the constraints a little bit, um, but that's just a example where with young, young athletes, like high school level athletes, like, you know, you're normally, there's short, it's, it's not to say that coaching is bad at a younger level, but a lot of times you, you get these things in your mind when you're so like malleable basically, and you, you just create in this habit, that's not necessarily good. And it's very hard to undo that and, and trying to undo that through this approach is uh, I've found that to be successful. Yeah, I think feeding the flaw is what you're kind of going into a little bit there is massive, especially for kids that don't want to overthink certain situations or they've been you know, bashing their head against the wall on a specific issue that they've had just like flying open through there. So many people are going to try to do something where they're like literally just like bracing their front arm here so they can't do it. But like that's taking the challenge out of it. It's doing it for them, right? So feeding the flaw and almost going into overdrive of that to see how they're going to problem solve is going to be massive and just make it that much easier when they don't have to do the overspeed portion of it. It's a great idea. And then a lot of times we can bring back the point you brought up earlier is that you can just travel upstream and try and force the athlete to make it better by doing something upstream. Yep. Cole Raddy, you got anything, any words of advice, any daily habits for the people to get better? Uh, daily habits wise, like kind of like you were saying about the pelvic awareness uh, situation, daily would be good. Um, 
I'd say uh, maybe using a mirror occasionally or, or taking video, but not being so focused on it, like doing reps with a, a camera, seeing what it looks like, trying a, a feel, and then checking the reel right after, you know, not to obsess about it or uh, like stay up all night watching it because I know some people do. I know I like to do that, but um, kind of checking out a feel, applying some data to it, whether that be vid video track, man, and then kind of cutting it off from there and taking what it's given you. Yeah, I think if you're going to take video, making sure that you have a goal of what you're taking video of and you're not trying to look at the entire thing because you're just going to constantly find problems, especially in slow motion. Like it's so easy to find flaws, right? But those flaws might not really be an issue. So really trying to target one thing at a time. I think it's so important. Same thing with drill work, really making sure that like that drill should be helping you with one specific thing and it should be changing into the next thing so much so that by the time you get to long toss or competitive throwing, you should only be thinking of one thing, right? The drills got, did what they had to do, right? It got you to this point. You get to think of one thing and one thing only. Don't think of multiple or else you're not going to get anything done at that point. Correct. Cool. Simple, singular focus by the time you're ready to do your skill. Yep. It's huge, I think. That was a great episode. Thank you guys for sharing that stuff. It was really good feedback, I think, really good perspectives for especially athletes that are listening, right? And just starting to, like we say it a lot, but just ask questions, whether it's to us, to yourself, and right, start to figure out the, the why behind your feel versus real and maybe look for things that you think are one way that are actually another and then ask us about them and we'll do our best to help explain kind of what's going on and like like we talked about there instead of banging your head against the wall let's put together a plan that can help you improve that because that's what we love to do and it's what we're pretty good at and I think next week we can dive into stuff like this a little bit more this was really good I like the open format of just kind of bouncing around on it and having a pretty broad topic and like like normal, give us some uh, comments or questions. I think this week on Instagram, we'll do a, a Q&A where you guys can submit questions on Instagram. And then we'll rip through some of the better questions on here next week. And we'll start to do that every week, which will be a, a nice little portion of the podcast as well. Um, other than that, like, yeah, we're, we're fourth week in. Going to do it again next week, make it week five. So if any of you guys out there have any tips, pointers, advice, whatever it might be, we are open to feedback because the goal is to get as many of you guys watching and interacting with this as you can. So share with your friends, share with people you think might benefit from listening. And if if you challenge some of the ideas we have, we would love to, to hear that as well. We're not just here to, you know, preach and then just listen, right? We want to be able to have back and forth about these things. And Logan and I were discussing some cool ideas yesterday about having some potential, uh, uh, like coaches, convention coaches, interaction type stuff as we get closer to baseball season where we can have a bunch of local coaches in and talk shop and try to give you guys a little bit of kind of our thoughts on certain certain topics and certain ways to handle practice situations and stuff like that. So stay tuned. We'll be back at it next week and hope you guys have a great weekend.